de pai que e casa e camula resuíte colher com dan de que nas gera so so gute so dan lá lá ganhamos uma creche dinga dinga jungle e e so suin so de lambele so when you get so hungry sometimes you tend to want to go steal and 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 you know and break into people's houses so you can eat but for me that's when I went to train I train for my school team and then I would go train for my club which was African Bombers at the time and then I would sit there the whole day and watch the first team watch every single team train and then I'll get home walk home when it's dark without the people in my community I wouldn't be the person I am today even with my family they didn't couldn't give me financially couldn't give me much but they give me love support and time and that's all you need as a child especially when I put on a jersey and remind myself who I'm playing for, you know. Everybody who's ever been hungry, everybody who's ever struggled financially, everybody who's walked to school without shoes on. Yeah, I'm going to phone bang lamb to fill up on your bandwana, but when you buy a happy location, can you happy now? I'm born and my boy has my booty. I'm not being very happy, I'm not so happy. I I take long to buy. I'll go to buy a clean down for me, you know, when he struggles as Nancy, if we find by the end of the year, he was about him I really think an individual can change South Africa. And and sometimes you gotta do something as simple as living your life and fighting for your dreams. And yeah, and sometimes you just have to tell your story. I'm Sam Tanda Kolisi. I'm proud to be a Springbok, but even prouder to be a South African. The final moments of the Rugby World Cup in 2019 is thanks to Supersport from South Africa, an insight into their inspirational leader of the Springboks, Sia Khaleesi. What a night it was for Springbok Rugby, the fact they went on to win their third Rugby World Cup, the first team to win, lose a pool game and then go on and win the big prize. Big night for them, disappointing night for England. A finish for the All Blacks on the Friday night against the Wales. Time to look back now on the 15 game, 15th game in 2019. We're on the couch. It's laid back tonight. We're relaxing. We're as relaxing as much as we can. Mills Muliaina, Kane Hames, Tony Brown, assistant coach of Japan, maybe former assistant coach of Japan, Tyler Nathan Wong, who's fresh off the plane from yesterday, the World Rugby Awards. Welcome home. Uh, great much. event. Amazing event. Had an amazing time. Got to meet some incredible uh, rugby players and, yeah, just celebrate all things rugby pretty much at the Rugby World Cup. Yeah, Ruby Tui won the big award. I think they might have got that slightly wrong. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> oh, let's see. Let's see. She had a great season as well. Great to see New Zealand rugby still up there at the highest level. Mills, it's all over finally in terms of the 15s and the World Cup has come to an end. But maybe just fitting the occasion on Saturday night, fitting of what was a fantastic Rugby World Cup. It was a fantastic Rugby World Cup. And how great was that to see, you know, see at Khaleesi and his sort of story sort of highlighting you know, uh, although you see a wonderful tournament and the flashiness of it, but the realisation of what really goes on, um, you know, in, in South Africa. But uh, wonderful tournament and, you know, the, the best team won on the day. Kane, uh, you look at the performance of England, you look at the performance of South Africa, we talk about those sides going into this Rugby World Cup final. Was it as competitive as you thought it was going to be? No, I don't think a lot of people would say that. I think a lot of people were probably banking on England doing a lot better, especially on the back of their performance against the All Blacks. But I know there are a lot of proud people in South Africa. There's a lot of uh, positive changes, a lot of positive things that are going to come off the back of Sia Kulisi lifting the Rugby World Cup. Brownie, you're a massive part of it. Of course, you took Japan with uh, Jamie Joseph for the first time through to the quarterfinals. For you, uh, you look at that end result, do you think it was fitting? Was it a fitting a game reflecting what this Rugby World Cup was all about? Yeah, I think so. I think um, <clears throat> South, Africa, South Africa can do some amazing things if they all have the same purpose and they get some quality coaching. And I think with Rassi at the helm, um, he got that group of players together and when they crossed that white line, they were physically more dominant than anyone in the World Cup and I think that's what won them the title in the end. It's all, are we at that point now? It's four more years. I mean, it's four more years. The fact that you know, there's so much build-up to this Rugby World Cup, 
But does this just uh, confirm and maybe put in perspective how hard it is to actually go out and win it and also give us maybe a little bit of, uh, I suppose, looking back at 2011 and 2015 and the performance of, of those, team, those teams, those all-black sides, and going, you know what, that, that, that was a, a phenomenal side. It was. Like, the All Blacks, they've been world dominant for, like, 12 years now. And all these teams had all that time, plus these last four years, to try and catch up. And, obviously, we did see that happen a little bit at this at this Rugby World Cup with England, obviously, coming through and, and winning that semi-final. But, again, England didn't perform when it counted. South Africa, their defence was amazing. Being there live and watching them D on that line for how many phases and hold England out, yeah, it was amazing the crowd the South Africans that were around us were just going off well it looked brutal on television uh, I'm sure it was more brutal live uh, fact. Yes. Uh, unbelievable intensity and like you say Brownie we know what South Africa can bring when they come together and play at their very very best let's hear about some of their reaction post the big game on Saturday night to see the joy in my teammates faces uh, that was the, the best thing I think for me we wanted to say thank you to our coach who's just changed a lot um, and on the way that we saw rugby as well. We started talking about what is pressure. And in South Africa, pressure is, is not having a job. Pressure is, is, is uh, one of your close relatives being murdered. And rugby shouldn't be something that creates pressure on you. Rugby should be something that creates hope. So uh, we started talking about things that we've got a privilege of giving people hope, not a burden of giving people hope. Hope is when you play well and people, no matter if your political differences or uh, religious differences or whatever, for those 80 minutes you agree. But there was a stage when CR went through stuff like that where he actually didn't physically have food or didn't have shoes to wear or couldn't get to school. And he led South Africa to hold this cup. That should sum up what CR is. Mills, we've made trips to South Africa a, a number over a long period of time. I, mean, I was fortunate enough to be in there in 1995 and see the impact that Rugby World Cup win made. Can this have the same sort of difference in that country? Or is that that's something maybe above our pay grade? Well, I mean, I think it will. It definitely has. But I think what's different to 95 is it's probably had a global effect. You know, now with the, the realisation about what actually goes on in South Africa and some of the things that, you know, she has sort of um, highlighted, you know, um, as I mentioned before at the top of the show, um, I think it does have an effect. So I think it'll inspire people. But to have someone there, the first ever, you know, black uh, Springbok captain, actually talking about it and now going through it and telling and telling and inspiring youngsters back back home where it's political and even Russia they're saying those sort of things. I mean that is pressure. I mean pressure in their country someone um, you know being murdered. You know, we, we just don't get a gl glimpse of what, what that is in, in uh, here in New Zealand or possibly some other places around the globe. Look, I know, Brownie, you, you love the analysis of the game. You understand the game as well as anybody. This is a real simple question. Why did South Africa win? Because they beat you in the quarterfinal. What did they do through the course of this tournament after losing to the All Blacks to then get to the point where they were the best team in the end? Yeah, well, um, from when I played over there for a couple of years, um, I always knew and I always knew that South Africa would be really dangerous if they got their coaching team right. And I think with Rassi and, and his crew of people, they got it right. And obviously with uh, Khaleesi as the captain, um, was able to, to, to bond them together and they had a common purpose. And when you play against a South African team that's committed to that one purpose, you know, they're almost impossible to, to beat. Um, and that's South African rugby. It's, it's a physical challenge every time you play. Two seasons ago, though, at Albany Stadium, the All Blacks trounced them, Kane. How do they turn it around? Uh, how much can be attributed to the fact they were able to bring all their players back for this Rugby World Cup? And when you look at this group, did they go back to type? Did they change the way they played? What is it they did so well tactically? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting you touch on being able to bring the players back uh, from overseas because there's so much quality for a lot of countries uh, that have that rule uh, where you can't select outside of that, and I understand, the, I understand the implications. If you keep your talent in your country, it's a bit stronger, but, but that's not necessarily the case for South Africa. They've got so many quality players playing outside. I actually think that was probably one of the keys. You can go outside, you can pick big names, you know, Vermeulen, you can pick all, uh, Fuff, Fuff de Klerk, you can pick all these guys who normally you wouldn't be able to pick. So bringing that quality back into the country, back into the green jersey, into a Rugby World Cup can make all the difference, and I think it did.
I, I think it works for their purpose. I mean, you know, they've gone away and said, well, this is what we've got to do to be able to make sure that we, you know, um, are in the best shape we can to win the Rugby World Cup. You can't necessarily say that works for other countries. And I think what they've gone gone to is, is said, well, we're not going to try and copy anyone else. We're going to make sure that this is about us and, and this is the plan ahead. And, you know, it's, it's, it's worked. Do you think that could work for New Zealand, though? Do you think if we selected from outside... Oh, you opened oh. up a can of worms oh, there. Oh, yeah, no, just, just, yeah, just a question. Oh, you know, I understand why we do it and why we keep all the talent here, but if you let the boys go overseas and select it from overseas, could it work for New Zealand? Possibly in a World Cup year, Tyler. I mean, there's, there's, those are conversations I'm sure the new next All Black coach is going to be looking at because in the end, there'll be a thorough review. We love a good review here in New Zealand. We sure you know, do, it'll take we? some time and we've got that process to go about. But let's focus on South Africa and, and focus on what it is they were able to do. And Tyler, I look at the game of rugby union and the first port of call is that ability physically. And this South African side, even their selection, the fact when they had six big bruises on the bench, you know, the way that they, they played this game. But... In this match, it was like it was so much more than just about that for them. I think this, the match itself, and I think just the overall of being able to represent their country and bring it all together, that's all the motivation they needed. They, it wasn't just about the World Cup and winning the World Cup, it was what that effect had on their country and on them as people. And I think when you've got that motivation behind you, going out, playing together, playing with your, their brothers, you know, that's all they needed to go out there and win. And it was a phenomenal performance. Leadership, experience, Brownie, the fact they had an inspirational leader, but the likes of a Faf de Klerk, Andre Pollard being fully fit. Did everything just fall into place nicely for them as they went through the tournament? I think so, and it was all built around their defence. Um, you know, they hardly missed a tackle all tournament, and when they did tackle, there wasn't much gain line um, <laughs> achieved. So the whole tournament was built around their D, and they showed glimpses of brilliance, um, especially in, in the width with their wingers. Um, but... I think there's many, many journalists have said that they win the World Cup from your defence, and South Africa did that. Yep. The All Blacks will be asking them questions about whether or not that's a, a path we go down. So, Mills, let's look at Sia Khaleesi then, the fact, the impact that he has had, the inspiration in the past of a like for Francois Pina. We shouldn't forget, though, he is a quality international world-class player. And that's first and foremost the fact, yes, the leadership is there, but he still adds as a player, and that still inspires the players around him as well. Oh, unbelievably so. And I think, I mean, you talk about the inspiration he brings from a motivational point of view, but also the game plan. I mean, that, that uh, you know, with him in the back row, Peter Steph de Toy, also Van Merlin, who's, for me, was really impressive and deserved to win the, the man of the match. I mean, yes, you've got to have a, a defensive um, effort and you make sure that you don't miss any tackles, but the kicking game comp complemented that as well. But then, the kick returns. I mean, I've, I've never seen a number eight that big being able to catch those high balls. And so you've, you've, everything that sort of came together for them, but they executed that sort of role as well. So for me, really, that sort of that loose trio um, with Khaleesi and, and, you know, Peter Steffi, Toyn and Van Merlin were outstanding throughout the whole tournament. Uh, talking, uh, look, talking about him as being the, the people's uh, champion. Uh, Rosie Erasmus, you talked about it momentarily, Brownie, just the fact that if he's not going to be head coaching, how, much, how significant is that for South Africa? Yeah, I think with, um, just if you look at the, the rugby team, South Africa, they're going to lose <coughs> Rassi, um to high performance role. Um, a lot of their players will go overseas again. They won't be, won't be able to come back as regular. Um, they won't be able to have them together to, to create that purpose that they were able to create for the World Cup, you know, so over the next two or three years, um, I don't know if they can achieve what they achieved at the World Cup. It'll be interesting to see. Uh, we, we shouldn't forget, this is the fact, they now equal the All Blacks as well as having won three Rugby World Cups. They didn't play in 87 and 91. So there are some discussions going around, some people talking about who is the most successful Rugby World Cup team. Well, if you talk about success and you talk about Japan and this Rugby World Cup, Steph is going to come in now and tell us that it wasn't just about the people. The numbers backed up everything we heard about what happened in Absolutely. Japan. Absolutely. This Rugby World Cup has been a huge success for rugby and for Japan. Let's have a look at some of these stats. There is a record 1.84 million tickets sold, a 54.8 million television audience for the Japan-Scotland game, and just a cool 437 billion yen economic impact for Japan. Not bad. So World Rugby's loaded. Yeah. <laughs> that's what we're saying. So if I want to see what World Rugby do for the next four years, because that's the important part here. If you've run a great tournament, you've given Steph, you've given Japan the opportunity. Brownie, you were there. 
Did it go as well as you expected with all the build up, all the hype going to it? Yeah, I think it did. I think um, I knew that the Japanese people would get in behind it and make it a success, um, but I didn't expect the success to be as, as big as it was. I think a um, couple of things there. I think obviously Japan getting on a bit of a roll and, and you know, inspiring a country to, to get in behind Japan made it extra special. Um, but by that stage, the whole country was, was on board for the World Cup. And when Japan went out, they followed the semis, they followed the final and made it a huge success. Well, Mills, you were over there early on in the tournament. And when I see a number like 1.13 million in terms of the fan zone, that tells me that it's not just always about what's happening inside the stadium. And maybe that's broken new ground in terms of how much support a country can give a Rugby World Cup. Yeah, absolutely, and you sort of seen it as well. You know, um, you know them getting behind the whole sort of whole sort of tournament. We always knew this that, that uh, Japan was going to put on a great um, sort of tournament in terms of the structure, um, you know, so the infrastructure and things like that. But also the following people that possibly possibly didn't even know anything about rugby, they got right in behind it, and then you coincide with that with the way Japan went, and all of a sudden you know uh, the, they're all over it. So um, in terms of being over there and seeing that, particularly in the early stages, was was awesome because you, you certainly sensed that the whole country was right behind it and you know the numbers have backed it up and Tyler you were there for the final itself and it seemed as though it, it was an electric atmosphere it sure was coming in the bus on the way to the stadium you just saw white jerseys coming past there wasn't many South Africans we actually didn't see many South Africans but just the whole atmosphere the chanting the cheering supporting the teams and when it was silent you could hear a pin drop do you get the sense that maybe Kane that England thought they were going to win <laughs> yeah, well, uh, like I said earlier, I think, I think a lot of people think they thought they were going to win. And just to touch on what you said earlier, um, how about the Japanese teams learning the national anthems of other countries and singing that too? It's amazing. And what I would like is to say as well, it seemed as though the players and the teams, Brownie, all of a sudden they bought into that whole respect thing and, and the, they bought into the culture that Japan was bringing to this Rugby World Cup. Yeah, that's right. And I think when you, well, myself, and I know Mills was in Japan playing as well, when you go there you learn an amazing culture and you learn the little things that make it great. And I think the, the rest of the world around the rugby players, they got there, they got their teams and they understood what it was to bow to the crowd and they actually enjoyed it and it became a, um, you know, Great World Cup for the fans, I, I believe. Yeah. Yep. Look, the rugby may well have truly finished, but of course, there's always plenty of news, there's plenty of reaction, plenty of talk, and Steph, as usual, plenty of people have got plenty to say. Yes, they do. In news this week, the 2019 World Rugby Awards were held in Tokyo on Sunday night, and no surprises there that South Africa collected the top three awards. Don't worry, though, New Zealand didn't leave empty-handed. TJ Perenara picked up Try of the Year, and Ruby Tui was awarded Women's Sevens Player of the Year, just pipping our very own Tyler Nathan Wong at the post, unfortunately. <laughs> Not only that, but Richie McCaw joined his former All Blacks coach Sir Graham Henry in the World Rugby Hall of Fame at a ceremony also held in Japan. Now, runner-up coach Eddie Jones is rumoured to stay on as coach of England right through until the next Rugby World Cup in France 2023. Jones is contracted to stay until 2021, but the side are eager to extend that right through to the next tournament. Now, moving on to South Africa, World Cup winners Damien Dialandi and RG Snayman are reportedly set to sign for Irish province Munster in what represents a major double signing for Rassi Erasmus' former team in Limerick. And finally, Tongan giant Ben Tamiafuna has been banned from playing by his French club Racing 92 until he loses 20 kgs. The former Chiefs forward returned from the Rugby World Cup weighing in at a staggering 160 kgs, which I can, I can relate, I feel about that heavy at the moment as well. <laughs> the 28-year-old was the heaviest player at the Rugby World Cup in Japan and Racing 92 have told Tamiya Funa that he will not be considered for selection until he gets back down to just a lean 140 kgs. Just a lean 140 kane. Haynes, yeah. you've had a bit of time on the sidelines. What are you rocking in at, champ? <laughs> oh, but, uh, yeah, let's not talk about it. Let's not talk at the moment, but I would normally play around 110 kg. So, so for Tommy Furna to get the luxury to only get down to 140 before he can play, uh, he's still a big boy. Yeah, uh, serious. I'll tell you what, we're talking about how good uh, rugby was in Japan, mate. He took you know eating in Japan to the next level. He's obviously had ramen, yakitori, yakiniku. Uh, 
Caught me up along with you with some other sort of Mate, liquid. You didn't mention you karaoke you chicken. Karaoke, <laughs> karaoke yeah. chicken for every single time. Well, it wasn't the only game on the weekend. The Springboks taking on England. Of course, the playoff for third and fourth. The bronze medal match between the All Blacks and Wales was on hand as well. And the fans, well, they still managed to have a good night at the office. Mate, tell us about tonight's game and how good were the boys? Oh, they were really good. I actually uh, thought uh, Ben Smith, Ben had a fantastic game tonight. I thought it was a good way to send him off. Hey, the All Blacks, they just um, battling us on the day. Uh, we all hope we could have done it for Warren Gatland, but uh, I think the Blacks probably had a little bit more for it because uh, they had the same motivation. But, um, yeah, no, well done, uh, well done, the Blacks. It was good. We uh, did ourselves proud. Shame we didn't get to the final, but... Uh, go New Zealand, you know? Well, I'm from Mexico. I'm the biggest Mexican fan of rugby. And all I can tell you is Warren Gatlin's done an amazing job. It means an awful lot to Welsh rugby. I think we've overperformed in the last decade under his leadership. And he'll be sadly missed in that regard. Um, we haven't won everything, but we've won a lot more than we might have won if we hadn't had him at the helm. Wasn't it fantastic to see the cheer that Steve Henson got, Kieran Reid, what an awesome finish, even though we came third, it was an awesome finish. It was quite an emotional game. I, you know, I saw Kieran Reid, he was really cut up, you could see that. And the standing ovation that he received was fantastic. To see him rock up there and just do it from the front and just throw those offloads, bang! It was good, bro, it was good. They played really well tonight. Um, you know, wish they had played just as good last week, so but yeah, it was a great game. Yeah, our ex can make it in the background, they had a great night. He had a great night at the office. Well, the All Black did as well. A dominant performance against Wales. We don't have to wait too long to see Warren Gatlin. Of course, he's coming to coach the Chiefs in 2020. Then he's got the Lions in 2021. Let's talk about the what -ifs. We love a big what -ifs after a performance like that. The fact we saw the All Blacks struggle against England. Six days later, they come up against Wales. And it was pretty comprehensive, Mills, that the way they performed. A lot of players got their opportunity to shine. We talk about Ben Smith. But hindsight's a wonderful thing thing. You look at this performance though, who was this performance for? Was it for the coach? Was it the players leaving? Or was it the fact some guys maybe wanted to prove a point? Oh, I think a bit, of, every, a bit of all those points you sort of made, but I was quite impressed with the way they sort of bounced back. You know, they were a big emotional week in terms of the fact they were out, you know, to get themselves um, back together and emotionally and, and sort of mentally as a team to come out and perform like that. But I think all those factors took its toll. Yes, Hindsight's a, it's a it's a it's a good thing, but you know I, you know I looked at this tournament. And I even thought you know how what a fine line it is to actually sort of get the balance right between experience and guys that are in form, you know, and in, in, on the more inexperienced side. So that's one of the possible things they'll go and review. I actually thought you know you've got to pick guys um, that are in form uh, during this time, you know, every four years, as opposed to the guys that you sort of wait for them to actually come out. And so you know. Reviewing that, and, and you know, as I said, it's a fine line getting that balance right now. And you don't want to simplify things, do you, Brownie? The fact it's a complex beast. The fact when you're selecting sides and putting game plans together, but if you're going to look back and you're going to compare the guys who played and, and the guys who didn't get to play, why was it we weren't able to get the performance we were looking for against England? Yeah, I think um, the toughest thing for the All Black coaches is they've got so much talent to choose from, and um, probably the other teams in the World Cup had their, their starting 15 chosen before the, before the tournament and they just rode them all the way through. All Blacks was a little bit more complex. Um, we had a few older guys um, sort of waiting in the wings and the younger guys were performing. Um, but on the, on, on the biggest stage in the semi-final, maybe they needed that experience and maybe they needed a bit more physicality um, to take on the English. And if you look at the Welsh performance and compare it to the England one, you know, I would have had Ryan Crotty and Sonny Bill in the midfield, Ben Smith on the wing, and Sam Kane at seven, you know. But if you would have rolled the, you would have rolled the old dogs out. I mean, but that's the reality. That's, that's the, the beauty of hindsight, right? It's, it's, it's the beauty of it. Toughest job but, in the world selecting the All Black team. But the positive, Kane and Tyler, is the fact that that the All Blacks were able to send off Steve Hansen, who has been a wonderful All Black coach, and he's he's led this team so very, very well. It was nice for the team to I suppose, send those players and their coach off in the right manner? I think so. The big question was, were they going to front up in that next game against Wales? And they sure did. And that's all that, you know, they would have had so many things, like you said before, all the different points. Steve Hansen, a lot of their players leaving and really wanting to step up from that, that semi-final loss. And I think it was a wonderful way for all those players, and especially Steve Hansen, to be sent off. Uh, Kane, if you look at the results then and we look at the performances of the teams across this Rugby World Cup, 
There was always talk over the last 12, 18 months after the All Blacks had been beaten by Ireland a couple of times. Australia beat us in Perth. Do you believe that the gap that was maybe the All Blacks had, that gap is well and truly closed? Yeah, I definitely think it has. A lot of teams have, have risen, risen their standard uh, and, and there's a lot of great performances coming out in the last couple of years. Obviously, Tony with Japan, uh, there's a lot of great performances. But it just does seem to be, Rugby World Cup, you can have great performances over the years and you can still close the gap, but you've still got to do a lot of planning, it seems, around a Rugby World Cup to get it, quite, to get it as right as you need to around that knockout time. And that's timing, right? And for a team like Ireland, a number of sides, they didn't quite get it right. Did we not quite get it right, Mills? <laughs> I mean, and that's the, that's the question we have to ask ourselves, the fact that we go in and, and did we prepare ourselves? And look, we know how hard it is to back up. England saw that in the Rugby World Cup final. We played a big game against Ireland. Is, are we simply talking about an 80-minute game? Oh, when it gets to the knockout stages, you simply are. You know, you've got to make sure, obviously, you tick the boxes in terms of getting yourself right in the, um, in the, in, in the pool games. But when you get to knockout rounds, anything can happen. And, and for often, for over the years, um, you know, we often spoke about that, you know, even though you play your worst game, you still want to be, you know, come out of those games having won by at least, you know, 10 points. We still haven't quite got there. And you know, obviously, you know, looking back at that, they'll, you know, they'll be thinking, well, you know, some of the things that they didn't quite get right. But I think game plan also. You know, that's when it sort of comes down and executing that game plan. And you've clearly seen that that's, you know, England beat us in that area, um, you know, on the day. I think, I, I, yeah, you carry I think on, yeah. um, like with the All Blacks versus England, I think Eddie Jones has been planning for, since he got the England job, to take on the All Blacks in the World Cup. And that's all he's been focusing on. Whereas the All Blacks have been planning to win the World Cup. Yeah. And I think... Well, we had to Ed, go through South Africa to start with. That's in right. The very first game. And Eddie got his planning right, and potentially, you know, he got caught the All Blacks with their pants down. Well, we do hold you responsible for a number of things because Japan beating Ireland certainly changed the course of the Rugby World Cup for us. The fact we probably weren't looking to play Ireland, but then you did that job. So, I mean, that certainly put pressure on us. But let's talk about the group then. Let's talk about uh, the groups or the teams that didn't make it. The ones that are looking to go away, have gone away from this Rugby World Cup, and they have failed. And let's talk about Australia first. <laughs> because our neighbours across the ditch, after walloping the All Blacks in Perth, Kane, they do not look any... I, I can't believe I'm saying this. They don't, I don't think I've ever seen them look worse. You know, I guess it's that thing you can play into each other's hands a little bit, because... If you sort of put out a performance like that in Perth, you can't recreate it the next week because the All Blacks have done their work. And then can you then recreate it again in a Rugby World Cup a little bit later on? Probably not. England definitely beat the All Blacks and they deserve to. They played really well. But they did something a little bit different that they haven't done before. So that's one of the tough things about probably showing your hand a little bit too early and which is why some teams maybe just take a little bit slow pre-World Cup and then unleash everything when we get to the World Cup. Look, it seems as though there were some things going on behind the scenes, of course, with Australian rugby uh, between the, the CEO and, and the coach and then you lose Israel Folau. They'll look at 2019 and they'll go, you know what, we'd like to just forget about that full uh, 12 months, Tyler, because, you know... I believe this Australian team had more about it, but it seemed as though they didn't have some of that collective uh, unit that, that South Africa and, and the good teams had. Yeah, there was so much obviously going on in the background and who knows what was going on within the team environment itself. And if we see the teams like South Africa, their environment, their culture, what they brought together is what jailed them as a team. And if you don't have that environment off the field right, it's not going to translate on the field at all. You're not going to get the good performances or perform when you want to at those, uh, those peak moments. And we obviously saw that with Australia. Well, Joe Smith, he found a way to beat the All Blacks twice with Ireland. Now he leaves having not managed to get any further down the road in a rugby world. Cup Brownie, where are they sitting right now uh, in terms of did they just miss their timing or can they continue to rebuild? I think they missed their timing and um, some key areas around their key players. I think all their key players went into that tournament underdone and carrying injuries. Um, so I think that affected their overall performance really. So you know they're having to rest Johnny Sexton. Um, you know Connor Murray was was always carrying injuries. There was questions over the their captain at hooker pre-tournament around whether he was um, fit enough to play. So I, th I think they probably got their timing wrong. wrong and, and you need good fortune and you need to be healthy. That's right, yeah. So if you need to be healthy then, Mills, what about Argentina semi-finalists four years ago? They come into the rugby championship, they play in super rugby. Is that pathway now, not in jeopardy, but does it work for them? 
Uh, I think. I mean, I, I still think they're competitive. It's, it's an interesting as well. We're, you know, we're talking off here, and Brownie brought up like a, a great point. You know, we, you know, when we speak about you know the South Africans going away and getting guys that are playing overseas, well, Argentina, they sort of came out and said, well, we're gonna we're gonna actually only allow to play for Argentina if you play in Argentina in Super Rugby, and the majority of that team. Played for the Sunwolves and they played right through. And you, and, oh, oh, sorry, the Hawares, and they went right through. They've gone in and played for the Pumas. So they'll, they, you basically went from what November, Brownie, like you mentioned, right yeah. through to, to the Rugby World Cup, which is, you know. So were they overdone? Well, they definitely were overdone. Like, <laughs> so the All Blacks get integrated back into Super um, when they're ready. The Hawares, they just got to punch right through. So do their November tour, have a couple of weeks off, then get ready to, to play in Super again. And they use the same players in the Jaguares as they do in the um, Argentina. So, mm. and both coaches want to win. Mm. So there's no rotating players. It's, it's just man eat man. Up they've got to the think top. about it, right? They've yeah. got to look at with their depth and they've got to work about it. Maybe just particularly in a World Cup year about, and freshen their players up. But like you say, they're competitive, they're passionate, they want to go out and win. Funny you mentioning uh, Super Rugby next year. We've got a breakdown special coming next Tuesday. We're going to talk about and announce the Super Rugby squads. The coaches are going to be in studios as well. That's 8.30 on Sky Sport 1. Don't forget, Super Rugby kicks off on January the 31st. Yes, that is right. It is the Blues. They are taking on the Chiefs. There is a new kickoff time. It is 7.05 p.m. That's when kickoff is going to be next season. Well, let's take a look now back at some of the great highlights that happened in Super Rugby for 2019. Bulls on the attack. Speckman gets smashed. Oh, oh. Here for a breakout. Oh! This could be the hit of 2019. Zia Wider and Alain Malo. Oh, oh, absolutely smashed there. From Seppa and Ben Lamb in the midfield. Ben Lamb. He's got Adi Saber on the inside with a left foot step. Another left foot step. What a show of class. It sits up for Debrasini and he beats one. Jack throws it back on the inside. And Leonard Brown gets it to Weber. This is oh. what they can do to you. Brad Weber, he picks up. Angus Tayama! Inside it goes. What a try. And Kui Pelotu sends it away to Akira Ioane. And he's in for the try. Breathtaking start to the second half. Gets it away to McKenzie. Damien McKenzie puts the foot down and he scores. Sensational try. Here he goes, mate. Hot dog Here in the he Here he goes. <laughs> he's putting in some new moves here, too, isn't it? Welcome back to the breakdown. Well, of course, it was a fantastic Rugby World Cup in Japan. And, of course, the hosts themselves managed the quarterfinals for the first time in history. All right, then, let's find out what they're going to do next. How do, how do they go about, Brownie? You, you, you're obviously <laughs> part of the coach. Let's find out what, what is important now that they've made the impact they were looking for. World Rugby's got to be thrilled. The fact you, you took it to that environment, you took it to, that, uh, to Japan, and they delivered. What ha needs to happen next for you? Yeah, I think it was a um, you know great for Japan to to get the World Cup there, and it got a lot of people supporting rugby, and now they're going to be supporting it for life because that's what the Japanese do. Once they once they find a sport that they love and and support, they're going to do it forever. And uh, you know, with Japanese rugby now, it's I guess it's time to while the iron's hot, you got to you got to get out there and you've got to try and create more Tier One tests, potentially get into the rugby championship as like the media are saying, and get some quality rugby in Japan every year. So Tyler, who has to come to the party then? Is it World Rugby? Is it Sanzar? Is it, does it, do the nations across the world, do they just pick up the phone and start ringing Japan and going, you know what, <laughs> let's pack a stadium out, let's play some rugby? I think it's all the above, really. They all need to keep this momentum going. Um, like we're talking a, a little bit off air as well, is uh, Japan, they don't need to win the games, but it needs to be um, competitive as well to hold to hold the audience. And I think having the Rugby World Cup there has been amazing. It's going into Tokyo 2020, the Olympics next year, with us going over there for rugby. So I think it's just going to keep that momentum going as well. I get a sense too, Mills, though. I think the world wants to see more of Japanese rugby because the way that 
Tony and Jamie and, and his crew brought, brought the team together, and the way that they played was something that we hadn't seen much of before. Yeah, and you know, what they've done you know, is actually co created this competitive sort of competition amongst the other sort of you know other sort of nations that they want to actually try and now and actually say, well, you know, Japan have done it to two tier one nations. You know, we want to have a crack at them as well. But I'll, I'll be interested to know from from Brownie, sort of how, how important is that momentum? You know, we've seen it in the, in the in the football World Cup when they had it there. All of a sudden, it just blossom to, to what it has become now but how important it is to make sure that you do actually compete especially in the early stage if you are going to go and, and bring sort of other tier one nations um, into, into competition yeah that's right and um, rugby at the international level in Japan is still amateur so the players don't get paid yep. so you know if we're going to play against the best teams in the world and potentially go into the rugby championship I think Japan rugby needs to take that um, take international rugby professional start contracting guys like Michael Leach and um, you know, the players that potentially will just stay at club rugby. Yep. Um, so get, keep the team together. There's six billion there, mate. There's six billion from that other than the World Cup. That, that might help. Rugby, so. <laughs> yeah, but if it's world's rugby's, I mean, uh, this is to me, and Kane, this is world rugby's responsibility. If you've invested in it and you've given them the opportunity, sure they wanna, surely they want to follow this through over the next period of years to give Japan rugby the test matches they need to continue to make their statements and maybe get more consistent. Yeah, well, I, I guess there's so many different factors that, that come into to a lot of those decisions. Will it make money? It's still a business. Um, is it viable? Uh, Brownie touched on it a little bit earlier where if Japan were to make into the rugby championship, they can't afford to lose uh, five games in a row. It's got to be something that works really well in so many different areas on a rugby development uh, side, on the business side. If it can tick all those boxes, I'm sure that you see a lot of push and, like Brownie said, strike when the iron's hot. Yeah, but Brownie, you guys are in camp for a long time. And you don't get that luxury. Japan won't get that luxury. Uh, one of its major players were the Sunwolves and Super Rugby. Our understanding is that they're only going to be in next year. That's what we believe. Do you think that's the right decision? The fact that it does Super Rugby and the um, company competition run side by side. Are the Sunwolves ever going to be able to be that support group for J the Japan national side? Um, I don't think so, but I, I don't think we want to get to a stage in Japan like, like the um, Argentina are, where they're using the same players for the same competitions over and over again. Um, you know, Japan have committed to um, making the company rugby over there, you know, the springboard for international rugby, and they feel as though it's at a high enough quality to get the players ready to play England in, in June or in it, wherever it is and potentially go into the rugby championship. Um, you know, so if they can create enough comp uh, a high enough level of competition at that company um, footy, then you know potentially there's good chance to be ready. Part of the Pacific Nations Cups as well, though. So there's, I mean, I think this is something Mills that needs to be thought through pretty quickly. Uh, the fact because they've already, you know, been an important part of that. It's important for the likes of Tonga, uh, Fiji, Samoa, the USA. Uh, their countries that are trying to continue to develop their own game. That this is where, and we've had this discussion before, and it keeps getting thrown away because World Rugby can't get on top of it. But this global season, in terms of getting all the parties together and working out, becomes so very, very important. If you're going to see Japan continue to grow. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right, and um, you know that's that's where they've got to you know come to the party as well. I mean, there's so many challenges, but you, you know, you, as you're saying, you want to get moving on this and get moving on it quick. But you also got to remember, there's so many challenges. You talk about the company rugby, you know, the standard there, you know, and it's it's a long way off being you know competitive, and so all these factors that have got to come into it. Yes. Um, what, what Tony and, and, and Jamie Joseph have actually created now is a big headache because now they've ticked off a box that they can. They do that can. often. Yeah, Headaches do. everywhere with these guys. They, they've ticked all the box the off that they can compete. You know, mm. So that, now that's ticked off. All of a sudden, you know, the whole talking about Asia being involved and you know, what, um, you know, from an economical point of view and what the funding that it can create is all of a sudden come back into um, you know, to questioning you know, can we actually go there and do that? Yeah, I think, I think also sometimes we think World Rugby is the boss, but I think Steve Hansen touched on it a couple of times. World Rugby Steve Hansen's still the boss. Sorry? Steve oh, no, no, you know, World Rugby's not the boss. You know, you've got the Six Nations who, who can sort of veto and, and, and sort of um, cancel out everything. And, and I think what Steve may, maybe said is people got to stop talking, uh, thinking about their own interests and a bit of business and thinking about the world game. And, of course, World Rugby, that's their job and they have to do it, but they're not necessarily the boss. Everyone else uh, in, in the Tier 1 countries need to buy in, and probably that's not happening at the moment. You talk about headaches, you talk about the fact for the All Blacks as well. There's plenty of change happening for them. Mark Robinson is the new CEO. Steve Hansen has stood down and Brownie 
you've been there's been plenty of talk about your future. I want to hear it from you. The fact that now you're back home, uh, we know that you are committed to the Highlanders for for 2020. What are you thinking uh, in terms of your international rugby future? Wallabies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, hey. Wow. <laughs> Throw the grenade. He's throwing a grenade in there with the wallaby. The wallaby guy. I tell you what, I could put the pin back in that one. I can go anywhere near Australia. I can tell you that for a fact. Um, yeah, I've, um, obviously after getting knocked out in the quarterfinals, I went home and had, had a good think about things. And, um, you know, obviously my name's been thrown around a few different coaches in and, um, and New Zealand that are potentially going to be going for the job. Um, but... You know, I love coaching with Jamie Joseph and over the last week I've sort of decided that I'm going to stick with him. Um, you know, I think our relationship, how we coach, how we know each other is what I love about coaching the game of rugby and um, I've decided that me and him, wherever he goes, I will go and uh, I'm not sure where that is. <laughs> I was about to say, uh, Jamie, Jamie can be very persuasive, th there's no doubt about that, but I mean, I mean, that surely wasn't a very easy decision to make because uh, you know, I understand Ian Foster and, and Scott Robertson, two of the, the leading contenders have rung and, and asked you to be part of their teams. I mean, you talk about loyalty here, and I love the fact you, you, you are talking about the fact that you, you've built this relationship with Jamie. Do you know what direction Jamie's thinking right now? Um, I'm not 100%. I'm um, sure, but um, he's he's home tomorrow, so I'll have a chat to him. But, um, you know, we both want to coach the All Blacks, um, you know, but I think we both want to do it at the right time and whether the right time's now, um, I hope it is, but it might not be, um, or it might be in four years. But it just didn't feel right to um, sort of be the guy that's floating around three different coaches um, to potentially get the job. It felt right just to stick with Jamie and continue what we've been doing for the last eight years. Yeah, and, and that, that's, that's been a process, right? The things you've had to learn as you go along the way, not just with working with Jamie down in Dunedin with the Highlanders, but also with Japan and all, all that experience. You know, as coaches, you just never stop learning, right? That's right, and it's, you know, no one coach is um, as good as the team, the coaching team. Um, you know, Jamie puts together a great, great team and we're all... Um, we're all part of making the rugby team better and that's what I love about coaching with Jamie is a, it's, a, it's a team, coaching is a team we call it and everyone's got, everyone's got their job but everyone helps each other so the team's successful, it's not your attack coach, your D coach, your set piece coach, it's everyone coaching together to make the team better. Tyler Mills, Kane, I think that the All Black coaching discussions certainly got a little bit more interesting right now for everybody, right, Mills? <laughs> Gee, I'll tell you what, he's, uh, yeah, he, it certainly has, because, you know, we, we were speaking about earlier on about the package and what that sort of, and obviously with Brownie, you know, um, his name was being floated around, but also, you've got to come in, you know, you know when, you're, when you're the world's, you know, at your peril, you're your oyster, mate, to, be, to say, well, step back. I mean, how difficult must that have been for you? I mean, you just got off a plane and gone home and thought about it for, I mean, you said a week and thought that wasn't right. I mean, for me, really, you know, when you look at that, it's the All Blacks, you know, you want to jump on board, but you certainly you know, taking that up. Well, how difficult was that for you, Brownie? Yeah, it was a massive, uh, massive decision because 100% I want to coach the All Blacks tomorrow. Um, but it just didn't feel right to me to um, sort of be floating between three different coaching teams um, where I don't get a say, you know. So, so I made the decision that I'm going to stay with Jamie and if Jamie applies for the All Black job, then I'm in. And if we go back to Japan, I'm in there too. But if he goes to Aussie, I'm not in. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Jamie, you're not going to Aussie. I think that's the, the package that we're talking about. I, I appreciate your honesty, Brownie, on the show tonight. Look, there was some great action coming out of the Rugby World Cup. There was action out of Super Rugby. We shouldn't forget while the Rugby World Cup was going on in Japan. The Mighty Ten Cup was in full action. And once again, there was plenty for us to enjoy. Tackle head on. That's the sort of thing that lifts a team on defence. Oh, driven back. Oh, oh big oh, tackle. Oh. Well, Mape. Back hit again. Nuhu this time on Northcott. Gives it to Karoi. He gets hammered from Phoenix. Christie now. Oh, big hit by Almua on Fayama and Nuku. On the inside, Asafa Almua. Big collision. And the champions. Welcome back to the breakdown. Of course, next week we are announcing the Super Rugby squad, uh, squads live here on the breakdown. It's time now for us to look at our moments 
of the week or the year, to be fair. We're going to go right back, and I'm going to start in the amateur game. It was going to be the All Blacks holding up the Web Ellis Trophy, but we didn't get to do that. So I'm going to talk about a prop from North Otago. Ralph Darling dropping back into the pocket. This is at the final. Heartland Championships, look at this. Struck it beautifully, Brownie, better than you ever. <laughs> Struck one for the Highlanders or Otago. That is right down the middle. I love a good... Pro Kane, you've never done that, right? I'm close. Close? Yeah. <laughs> what, you dropped down to the pocket and never got the ball? Or no, just... I just dropped it. I, like... <laughs> <laughs> I love it, I love it. Mills, for you. Oh, for me, it would have to be the Suva game. Uh, the, um, the Chiefs. The Chiefs, mate. The Chiefs what versus shock. the Crusaders. Brilliant game, and at this stage here, I almost, almost turned the TV off, but because I'm a loyal Chiefs fan... <laughs> you told us in the, in the rehearsal you I hung in there. Hey, hey, this is my moment. <laughs> I hung in there. I hung in there. And look at the result against the Crusaders, mate. Unbelievable. You got a text saying they're coming back, right? I said, you better turn it back on. <laughs> you flick it back over, right? <laughs> flick yeah. it back over. What were you watching? Hey, I know. Oh, look, I was at that game. There was no doubt about it. A fantastic, fantastic game. Kane Hames is on the show. He's been busy in Mitre 10 Cup. And Kane, I have no doubt what we're going to be looking at here. Tasman Michael. The Tasman Michael. <laughs> yeah, what a shock. What a huge year. Yeah, all it's your been jerseys for them. in the sky today. Yeah, you I mean you've got local coaches. Clark Dermody's adopted son now, and you've got uh, oh, right. Goody. Local. But that moment there is one of the biggest moments for me. David Havili, Motueka boy, uh, Nelson Rugby Football Club, Nelson College, Tasman through and through, and to see him raising that sparkly big old trophy. Um, there this year has been a huge moment for me. Special, special season. Uh, undefeated. Brownie, uh, for you, uh, we're going to go Rugby World Cup. Which game was it? Oh, I'd have to be the Scotland game after all the bitching and moaning <laughs> <laughs> from, the, from, the Scottish, from the Scottish guys. And, and it was always going to come down to that one game. And even though we beat Ireland, we still had to beat Scotland to make it through to the quarters. And, you know, the boys played out of their skin. And um, it was a fantastic day in Yokohama. Amazing crowd, best crowd I've ever been involved in. Oh, you fronted. There was no doubt, no doubt about that. Tyler, for you. Uh, attending my first ever Rugby World Cup as a fan, but then also oh. attending the awards alongside two of my incredible teammates. It was a blackout for the second year in a row, three Blackburn Sevens players, up for World Player of the Year, and it was a pretty special moment to be there. Oh, fantastic. And, and that environment around those players, so, I mean, was it just an eye-opener, the fact that all of a sudden when you're at something like that? Yeah, it's just, it's just incredible. Like For us three, out of all the teams that play in the world, the 12 countries, for three New Zealand players, again, for the second year in a row to be up for that award, I think it just shows uh, how well we've been going as a team. Yeah, have been fantastic. You know that. And Steph, we're going to finish with you, and this is going to hurt. I can tell. <laughs> this is giving you opportunity. Come on, then. What are we finishing Oh, on? it's no surprise that it's the Crusaders this year. Oh. Shocker from me. What a shocker <laughs> from you. Run us through it, you know. Come on. Oh, I don't need to say anything. They're the oh. best team. It's, it, it was always going to happen, but... It, it was always going to happen. <laughs> what about the other 14 teams <laughs> in this competition? And break dancing. Look, a, a, a wonderful, wonderful season uh, from the Crusaders. Something, something to celebrate. And Steph, we've got a present for you. We've got a gift. I'll tell you what, and you might need this. <laughs> Biggest moment for you in 2019 is going to be in a couple of weeks' time. Oh, thank you. Fantastic. Look forward to everything. Thank you. So uh, JK Champagne in there. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> They'll have to go to somebody else. It's a fantastic job. Good luck a couple of weeks' time. Thank you very it's much. A fantastic job. Thank you much, team. Thanks, Brownie, for coming up. Tyler, Kane, Mills, you've had a fantastic season. Razors, they're on sale, mate, at Supermarket. Oh, you can man, buy one of those. <laughs> my vendor coming on. I can't say it. Fantastic to have you with us. Make sure you stay with us in two, uh, seven days' time where there'll be super rugby teams to look forward to enjoy. We will see you then. I'll see you next season.